Hey Rayleigh and anybody else watching and welcome back to another message from your father. Today we are finishing off 2 Corinthians which means 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So five chapters today. Um, should go fairly quick actually. But uh, if you remember yesterday we were looking at um, our heavenly dwelling. We looked at reconciliation. Uh, looked at Paul's hardships yet his joy. Talk more about that. Uh, encouraging generosity. Also, Titus being sent out to Corinth um, as well. So today, uh, more on sowing generously. We'll see Paul. We'll see Paul speaking about that. Uh, also, the defense of his ministry, false apostles, sufferings, uh, his vision, and then very importantly, his thorn in the flesh. What we can learn about that. We'll hop over to Daniel really, really quickly. Um, but then also um, his concern for the Corinthians and then final warnings and final greetings. So again, 9 through 13 in 2 Corinthians. So chapter 9. There is no need for me to write you about this service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Acacia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me, and we find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance, and finish the arrangements for the generous gifts you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food also will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge in the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Chapter 10. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg to you, or I beg you, that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the, the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. If you are looking only on the surface of things, it, you are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with any of my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify comparing ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits. We will continue our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far with you as the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. 
Our hope is that your faith continues to grow. Our area of activity to activity among you greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory, but <clears throat> let him who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not one who commends himself who, who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Chapter 11. I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind somehow may be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I do not think I am in the least inferior to these super apostles. I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Acacia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows that I do, and I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an, an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things that they boast about. For such men are false, false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the, as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly will put up with fools, since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves, or who enslaves you, or exploits you, or takes advantage of you, or pushes himself toward forward, or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk, about, to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger from the sea, in danger from the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas, uh, Artas had the city of the Damascians guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and sit, slipped through his hands. Chapter 12. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know, about, I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. Was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell, 
I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even though I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. The things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles, were done among you with great perseverance. How were you inferior to the other churches, except that I was never a burden to you? Forgive me for this wrong. Now, I am ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children... After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything that I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you. Yet, crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any men I sent to you? I urged Titus to go to you, and I sent our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? Did we not act the same in the same spirit and follow the same course? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ, and everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humbly or will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. Chapter 13. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now, we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is for your perfection. This is why I write these things when I'm absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not tearing you down. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection, listen to my appeal, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All, this, all the saints send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there's some really harsh yet great realizations that Paul is helping this church realize before he visits. There are a couple things regarding uh, that suffering. It's so important to keep pressing in on that because that's something that we keep experiencing, this problem of hardship, this problem of evil, or in Paul's case, this problem of the thorn. We can see that in a couple places. Uh, I have two notes, three technically, uh, that I want to look at here. Uh, there was a note on 12.7. 12.7 says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surprisingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So 12.7 says, uh, the note here says, 
Bible scholars don't agree on the precise nature of Paul's thorn. Some suggest a physical ailment, such as an eye disease, malaria, or epilepsy. Others interpret it as a spiritual temptation or a sequence of failures in his ministry. The Bible gives no clear evidence on the precise nature of this affliction. Regardless, Paul stresses that God permitted the thorn to continue despite his prayers for relief, to teach him an important lesson about grace and dependence. This conclusion echoes Paul's thoughts on the Corinthian suffering in chapter 7. So that takes us to 711, and we have a note there as well. So 711 says, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So the note here says, what suffering produces. When he wrote about suffering, Paul concentrated not merely on the pain itself, but on what the qualities it produced in those who had faith. In this case, he cites the emotional suffering the Corinthians had experienced because of his letter. Although the suffering was unpleasant, it produced something of great value, an abrupt change in their attitudes. So I believe that God is wholly good, but he does allow pain. I mean, that's what we're seeing here is when pain happens to us, Sometimes God allows that to persist. So what's our response to that? What do we do with that? Well, Paul continues to recognize, he continues on and recognizes that, hey, this is so God's glory can be shown through his weakness. And what should our response to be that? Be to that? Well, I, candidly, I don't 100% know. But what makes sense to me is what we find in Daniel from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we find that in Daniel 3, 17 and 18. And this is when they're being put in the fiery furnace. And their response to King Nebuchadnezzar, when he says, who can save you? I'm going to essentially throw you in here into this fiery furnace. Who can save you? Their response in 17 and 18. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I think that's a great response. If you're having trouble kind of creating that parallel there, trouble and hardship are going to befall us. And yet, I believe that God will rescue me from that. However, if he does not rescue me from that or rescue me from hardship or, um, or a sp specific trouble, my God is still good. He is yielding in me something that I might not be able to see through the pain and I might not be able to see until tomorrow or the next day or years later. Uh, this is something that people seeing how I am responding to trouble, I can be ministering to them without knowing it. That's my prayer for you, Rayleigh, that you suffer well when you do suffer, that you continue to pray God and pray to God and praise God through it, but that you suffer well. It's a weird thing to, to wish for your child, but that is absolutely what I wish for you. Know that I love you and I'm praying for you. For anyone else joining, know that I appreciate you as always, and I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.